Good afternoon and welcome to the Greenleaf Financial Fitness Series, 20 Minutes to a Healthier, Wealthier You. Today's episode, we'll be talking about debt and credit. We always like to give a quick introduction to the team before we get these kicked off. Here we have uh, Jamie Greenleaf. Jamie is a partner and advisor with Cafaro Greenleaf. Uh, Jim Hiles here with me today, managing partner at First Capital Advisors Group. Hello, Jim. And uh, yours truly, Jim D. I am a financial advisor with Greenleaf Financial. And a special guest with us today, Director of Education and uh, Compliance Manager with Cambridge Credit Counseling is Martin Lynch. So we're happy to have Martin with us today. Hello, everybody. Hi, Martin. So first, we're going to um, start with the story of financial stress. You know, most people, maybe all people experience it at one time or another. As you can see here from the numbers, 55% of people polled uh, admitted to being worried about their future and running out of money in retirement. We see 25% of people feel financially fragile, meaning they probably or certainly could not come up with uh, $2,000 in one month for some kind of unexpected expense. And uh, feeling financially anxious, we see another 55% number. So those numbers are significant and a lot of people believe you know, they could be much higher than that due to underreporting. Financial stress and your health, and one of the big reasons we're talking about this, right, is that uh, financial stress is known to cause very real health issues. So in, in a real sense of the word, personal financial health can be considered an actual health care issue because these are all obviously uh, issues that are dealt with through health care providers. So everything from heart disease to diabetes, cancer and substance abuse uh, can all be attributed to in some way to financial stress in many situations. This is from the, the Cambridge credit site. So. You know, at the risk of beating a dead horse, we included one more slide here. You see, you know, there's a lot of people in, in debt. Uh, they have credit cards. Average credit card holder has at least four cards. And I think a, a point that can be taken from this is, uh, you know, if one of these things affects you, you're certainly not alone, right? It's a big issue in our country. So with that, I think, uh, Martin, this might be a good time to bring in you to talk to us a little about credit, credit scores, and can you speak to us about that a little bit? Recently, we've gotten uh, quite a few inquiries about uh, the new release of uh, the latest iteration of FICO scoring model, that's FICO 10. Uh, what people should know is that most lenders are still using FICO 8, so they're still back two formulas uh, ago. So you may see fluctuations in the score uh, where you normally check it, uh, in the coming months, or you may not. Uh, some of the changes are going to kind of smooth over uh, one-time events. Uh, for instance, if I recently um, and very uncharacteristically added a large charge to a credit card, but I always pay on time and I'm just whittling that debt down, the new FICO model will smooth out that bump uh, where ordinarily my score would have taken a major hit, uh, this model reportedly won't do that to me. Um, but by and large, people really need to understand the five basic elements of their score and how individual activities or actions will affect their score. Uh, the biggest thing is payment history, obviously, how you pay your bills, whether you have accounts that are in collections. The next biggest category is the percentage of credit that's available to you that you're currently using. Uh, we like to see that kept under 25% if possible, but you know if it does move up, if you suddenly need to use 50% or more of your credit, can you be disciplined in the months that follow and pay it back down and get it back under control? Because that's a huge portion of your score. Okay. Uh, the length of credit history is one that people don't understand when they close accounts. Uh, we do encounter a sizable number of consumers who, you know, they're tired of paying 25 or 28 percent interest on a card where they might have missed a payment or two. Um, it's got a decent balance, so they figure that their best move is to move the balance elsewhere and cancel that card. But in doing so, they impact the length of credit history category and the percentage of credit use because they just got rid of a credit limit. You're recommending keeping that credit card open as opposed to closing it, just don't using it? Is that the idea? Yeah, transfer the balance, that's fine, to a, an account that has a much better interest rate. 
but keep the older accounts open and performing because they're doing good for you in two different categories. Got so it. there's rarely a good reason to close an old account. And then the last two categories really are affecting people who uh, are trying to reestablish credit or build credit for the first time. You can't avoid doing a little bit of damage when you open a new account, but you know to broaden your credit or to to get going and get your toe into the credit world, uh, those uh, little hits to your score are, are inevitable. Uh, so they're not really anything that we're overly concerned about. It's more of the first three categories. Got it. Okay. So let's move on to credit myths and mistakes. What can you tell us here? Because there's a lot of them out there. I used to, I do uh, four or five seminars a week. I still encounter people who think that checking their score is going to negatively impact it. That's not the case. Uh, only applying for credit is going to damage your score, but the amount varies. Uh, there are three types of loans, car loans, student loans, and mortgage uh, applications that are bunched together. Uh, they're batched together in 45-day batches, uh, most typically, uh, and they're treated as one inquiry. But every other type of application, uh, for instance, if I went home and went online and I applied for half a dozen credit cards, which I could easily do in under 20 minutes, my score would come down six different times. Uh, so knowing how the scoring system works helps you shield yourself from doing in inadvertent damage. And it also kind of reflexively tells you what to do to improve credit. So knowing those five elements uh, is really uh, something you need to start with uh, when you're creating a strategy to move your score up. Martin, question, this is Jim. I, what about things like services like Credit Karma? Does that help or hurt or what does it do? Uh, Credit Karma is an excellent site. I first joined with them ages ago when the site was looked like it was just up and running. Uh, it's much improved now. Uh, the one thing that, that uh, a lot of people think when they look at their score on Credit Karma is that they're seeing their FICO score. That is not the case you're seeing what's called a Vantage score. Vantage is simply a different formula from FICO. It's not as widely accepted, but it has a lot of good qualities. The best thing that you can do is to check your score on Credit Karma, get your Vantage score there, then go over to one of the sites that provides a free FICO score, compare those two scores together and do the same thing next month and the month that follows and see if you know, if they regularly differ by just five or six points and they maintain that kind of margin, uh, then that's good to know no matter which formula uh, a lender may, uh, may be using. Are they typically pretty close together or are there cases where people have scores that are vastly different from Credit Karma onto the one of the credit report sites? They're usually pretty close together, but, you know, the one thing that that also amazes people is that credit reporting in this country is entirely voluntary. So uh, at Credit Karma, you're only seeing two of the three reports. If you look at, uh, at the other report and it has a couple of accounts that aren't listed on uh, TransUnion or Equifax then, or Experian, then the score is gonna vary. It's going to be different because your score is based on what's in your report at that moment. Got it. So you hit our next uh, bullet point on the next slide there. So why don't you tell us a little bit about credit reporting a little bit more, if you don't mind. A lot of the assumptions, especially for young people uh, who move into their first good job, they think their credit is improved. Actually, nothing has happened because income has never been on your report and it never will be. I do see a lot of uh, consumers who are becoming aware that bad information remains for seven years. They aren't as aware that that paid in full accounts or good accounts can stay for 10. Very few people know that their rent payments can now be reported. That was a change that came in with FICO 9. It had already been with Vantage for a while, but not very many landlords know that they can report. There are a few for-profit services that will uh, take the stress out of the situation. They'll either show the landlord how to report or you can pay that company as a middleman. They'll pay your rent 
uh, to the landlord on time and they will report to the credit bureau. So it can work either way. Uh, they can actually jumpstart your credit by going back as many as 24 months if you've made rent payments on time, they'll add that to your report also. Uh, so those services are definitely worth uh, considering if you've been a regular rent payer and, and you make payments on time. By all means, consider them because they can really impact your credit in a good way. If you find mistakes on your report, you can go through the credit bureaus. The, the process is a little sluggish. I always find it's better to challenge a bad entry uh, directly with the creditor and let them fix it. You know, if it's a simple question of, you know, you report my balance as $200, my balance is really 20, I have my last statement, something you could confirm with your, with your lender or your creditor right away and let them just make the, uh, change the reporting the following month to the credit bureaus. Much easier that, or faster that way. Okay, just a quick question. Can you recommend a site to the people on this uh, webinar for, if you want to check your FICO score, where they would, what's the best way to get that? Uh, actually, if they have existing credit uh, credit cards, their card issuer probably already uh, offers uh, the ability to check the score for free. I see. If not, yeah, if not, Discover offers a free credit report, a free FICO score check. I'm not a Discover card holder, but I've been checking there just so I can keep recommending it okay. to to consumers. And I have to say, I've not been bombarded with offers to sign up for discover okay. and i haven't been capped yet i you know they haven't said hey you've checked 10 times <laughs> you know that's that's enough right, uh, right so take advantage of that while it's you know while it's open oh that's a good tip yeah i didn't know that next you know we're now moving into the next phase here of what we were going to talk about today which was debt relief options so there's a lot of information and advertising out there for debt relief and and obviously you're here to tell us how they differ because they're not all created equal. So why don't you tell us how they're different? Credit counseling, you will repay the full principal you borrowed, the full principal balance, but you'll do so usually at much lower interest rates. We're talking our average rate, our average client comes to us, the rates in the mid twenties, we can get their major creditor accounts reduced to six, seven or 8%. Uh, in debt settlement, you're going to pay half of the principal balance, but you're also going to pay a large fee uh, to the settlement company, usually 40 to 45 percent of what you thought you'd saved. And you're going to pay Uncle Sam because debt that's forgiven is counted as taxable income, even though you didn't receive any money. Really? OK, so yeah. that, that sounds like a, a, a trap people would not expect. Exactly. Uh, they do disclose it on the website. So, you know, I check some of the major debt settlement companies, but it's something the consumer is not anticipating. They're just looking to pay half of what they owe. Uh, the other thing is that it raises a red flag for future lenders because right. it tells them that you're, you may only receive half your money back if you lend to me today. <laughs> that's not a good, <laughs> that's like not that. a good message to send. No. Yeah. Uh, bankruptcy, uh, a much more global approach to uh, to the issue, but for you know, for millions of Americans, year to year, it is the right option. They discharge all of their unsecured debts, or they pay a portion of that debt, depending on uh, how they stack up on the means test that their attorney will uh, put them through. But it's a it's meant to resolve issues that aren't going to be easily taken care of through either of the other two options. You will need to go through counseling both before you file and before you get your discharge, uh, but those are relatively quick and painless. And either, you know, if you're filing Chapter 7, you'll get your discharge within a matter of months. Chapter 13, the repayment plan, usually runs three to five years. Uh, but again, you're dealing with more significant issues uh, than the other two options. For sure. Uh, the, the one that the debt relief option that people frequently overlook is the ability to increase their income or decrease expenses. It seems obvious, but... Well, right. But, Those are um, behavioral issues more than anything. Right. Yeah, right. there's a, a tendency to think that, well, I can't work weekends or, you know, I'm already tired enough on Fridays when I get home. How could I do more? If, if it's a means to temporarily resolve a debt that once it's, you know, once it's paid in full, it's gone for good. 
then it's worth considering. And the same, especially for decreasing expenses. Right, good points. So now we're gonna get into student loan a little bit. We've been talking about mostly consumer debt up to this point. So, so tell us how student debt is different and how it's treated differently and what we should know about that. Well, it is different primarily because the majority of student loans are extended by the U.S. government. So it's a unique lender. It also comes with unique repayment and collection ability. Uh, federal debts do not go away. So, and they have the unique ability to garnish 15% of your wages if you don't pay on time and to uh, intercept tax refunds, you name it. So they want you to pay attention because that's the money they needed to lend out to next year's uh, students. So they are serious about it. It's difficult to discharge in bankruptcy, but not impossible. Most people aren't aware of that and a lot of attorneys aren't aware of that either. But it is a growing problem. Uh, we see it with our own client base. We see it with seniors entering retirement. Right, that's, that's an issue. One, that, right? <clears throat> yeah, that's that's growing as you see on the uh, on the slide, up 44% since just 2010, and the amounts that the average senior owes are significant. I mean, 33,800 on average to be repaid when you're not working is tough. So you're uh, not, you're not talking about student loan debt as a senior, are you? You're talking about talking about student loan debt as a senior? Yes. Wow. They're either carrying their own debt. Uh, I actually encountered a case today where a retiree is, if she does not extend her working years, is going to go off with a little over 70000 in debt that she took on for a PhD right at the end of her working career. Huh. Not advisable, but that's what happened. But if she continues to work another five years, she might be able to pursue a discharge. But the thought of, you know, covering a grandchild's student loans uh, or taking out loans to help them out is just puts them in a difficult position as they march into retirement where there are no other options right. uh, like the student has. Yeah, right. No scholarships for retirement. Right. It's it's uh, it's interesting when we do retirement planning. That's one of the things we look for, and we highly recommend that parents generally do not get on the student loan for these kinds of reasons. You're better off allowing yeah. the student to be on the student loan because they have the, their entire career to pay that off for his parents. Really. Exactly. Yeah. Right, so as far as e-payment forgiveness options, we're 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 running close on time, but but I think this is worth it. So why don't you just talk to us a little bit quickly about. Um, you know, the repayment and forgiveness options that are out there people might be, you know, might not be aware of or familiar with. Okay, so private student loan repayment, there are very few options. You check with your individual lender. Some will extend the time, you know, the term to repay slightly, but it's not very forgiving. On the federal side, if you call your loan service, they'll give you a forbearance like candy. They'll gladly defer payments, but if you do that, the interest on both unsubsidized and subsidized loans is going to grow. Forbearance is not is like a band-aid on a brain hemorrhage. It's okay. not the, the correct course. If you're having difficulty making payments because something's happened with your income or expenses are out of control, income-based repayment is a much better option. That's what you want to pursue. And, right, and that's uh, not the easy. The easier one is the one they want. It. They would rather you do a forbearance, is what you're saying. Exactly. There's a big disincentive uh, in that area that needs to be addressed by the government. If you work for a qualifying nonprofit or an agency that does work similar to a nonprofit, I realize that's a huge gray area, but that's the way it's written, then you have special forgiveness options. After you make 120 qualifying payments, which means you have to be in an, in an eligible repayment plan, have paid on time, and have loans that themselves are eligible, then after 120 payments or 10 years, you can discharge whatever balance is left. There's a lot of negative and misinformation out there about that because so few people are being approved for discharge. Mostly it's because they've miscounted how many payments they've made or all along they were in an ineligible plan. So that's where our counseling comes in because we can straighten that out and explain uh, when you're gonna qualify, why you aren't qualifying currently, what you need to do to make your loans eligible. So sum that up for us. If somebody uh, if somebody does work with a company like yours, what, what they 
you know, what could they expect from you? What could they expect to pay, if anything? And uh, what would they expect to receive in return? Okay, so if they come to us, we're gonna ask them to, because we're, we're in the education business, we're gonna ask them to go access their student loans. We send them to a portal where they can input their information. Charge, the maximum charge for that is $39. Uh, for some teachers unions will cut the charge in half but at that point they're going to see what options they have what the monthly payment estimates would be and then they call us for counseling and we'll go through it with them to to show or to explain why this particular loan isn't eligible at this point or if you change repayment plans and got into this one you'll increase the amount that you could have forgiven in the end there's a lot of moving parts with student loans uh, counseling is advisable, I think. The maximum anybody off the street who's unaffiliated with any of the nonprofits we do business with would pay is a little over $200. We're not like the, the uh, student loan counseling agencies out there that'll gouge you 2000 or 1500 or a portion of your loan balance. Our, ma our ceiling is in the low 200, so that's why you're on this call, Martin. Yeah. We, we, that's we, why our um, phones are ringing up the hook for this service. Yeah, homework. So, so just a quick example, which we took from from you guys on and how you were able to save somebody, um, you know, in one of their, uh, you know, debt repayment programs. If you want to just, you know, you obviously people can, sure. right? You you were able to reduce in a situation like this. Eighteen. You took somebody's interest rates down from eighteen percent to eight. Save them a great deal. Right. A great deal of payments and a great deal of money and interest, right? So that's that's kind of why somebody would want to deal with a company like yours. You're right. The the Card Act mandates that the credit card companies show you how long it would take to to pay off your balances. Uh, but through a debt management plan, our maximum is 60 months. We negotiate with the lenders to reduce interest. You can see our average currently is 8%. There are some lenders that have gone to 0%. Uh, there's some that don't play ball. It depends who your lenders are, who your creditors are. But our average across the board right now for an uh, incoming client is 8%. Okay, that's so great. that, re yeah, it's a great deal. It reduces the monthly payment. The accounts are closed, uh, but for most of the people who approach us, they've already done damage by either missing payments or they're close to maxing out the account, both of which or either of which would really impact their score. Our incoming clients in the first year see a score or reduction of about 20 points. Over the remaining uh, three and a half to four years of their program, they usually gain uh, about 40 to, to uh, 40 to 55 points. I believe my math is right. So by making, you know, getting on a debt management plan that where we disperse monthly payments on time to your creditors, you're rebuilding your score and then some. But that's an ancillary benefit. Really, we're trying to get you to change your behavior, do a budget, get on track, abide by it, be disciplined, let the payments be made. And you can do other things to, to rebuild your credit while you're on a uh, plan. Great. Uh, becoming an authorized user with, you know, with a loved one's accounts will do wonders for your credit. Great. All right, well, Marty, thank you very much. So we're just gonna sum it up here quickly because we went uh, over time today. Basically, first tip is know your monthly budget, know what your spending plan is, and give consideration before taking on any debt to begin with. Understand your credit score. Uh, if you're considering debt relief, understand the differences. Uh, learn about your repayment options for student loans. Uh, to connect with Marty's organization, go to gfplan.com and click on credit and debt counseling. It's right there on the homepage. Uh, that's a you get a free consultation and we also um, negotiated some discounts on some of the other services of course you can always call us there's the phone number 732-945-7472 or email us and uh, remember to join us March 10th at 2 o'clock uh, for our next webinar lost in space 